already. Hey guys, we got a couple minutes here before we get going. We'll try to kick it off right about 3 o'clock or so. We'll watch the uh, AC-10 kind of do its thing for a few minutes here while we're waiting for everybody to join us. before we get started here. We never have too much. That's your beer? Yes, <laughs> yeah, I might have got too much, actually. It smells like a fresh can. Like what? Fresh can. about three o'clock here so we're going to get started my name is dana poling with c and e advanced technologies and we got our uh, assistant here is off camera he'll be here in just a second but uh, so jeremy fultz is with us today jeremy is a marketing specialist for us so he's helped us with the production and getting us on on youtube and uh, maybe just as important today he's also a craft beer enthusiast so what we've been doing here over the past several months is taking our uh, robot road show to happy hour events at different breweries around the area around the three and a half states that we cover <clears throat> and uh, since we can't do that right now we decided to bring it to you over youtube um, and then so as part of that what we're going to do is feature local breweries we're actually going to feature different drinks even so craft beer is today's drink of choice uh, for these next series the, the next five there may be different drinks that are featured craft beer may show up again here or not but the brewery that we're focusing on today and featuring is jackie o's so Jackie O's is in Athens, Ohio, which is also the home of Ohio University. <clears throat> and uh, OU happens to be my alma mater. I spent uh, seven wonderful years of my life there from 1993 to 2000. So I was in engineering school, school there, uh, stayed for grad school. They offered me to stick around Athens for two more years and uh, couldn't pass it up. So I still have quite a soft spot in my heart for everything Athens, and that's kind of how we got to Jackie O's today. So our first beer that we're looking at today, we're actually going to feature three different beers from these guys today. The first one is Who Cooks For You? And that's what we just poured here before we went live on camera. And uh, Jeremy, what do you think about this one? Well, uh, this is one of my favorite styles, actually. It's a, they call it Hazy Pale Ale or New England Style Pale Ale. Right. Yeah, well, it's uh, mm -hmm. really got the hazy color to it. And they're typically really big on the floral and uh, citrus notes. And yeah. This one's definitely very uh, juicy, as yeah. they would say. Have a juice bomb, but yeah, it's, it's one of my favorites that they make. Yeah, uh, you know, being an Ohio guy myself, I've had lots of Jack Yo beers, it's one of the newer ones, but uh, definitely a fan. Yeah, for sure. Um, the hazy IPAs, so this one is, I guess, just a pale ale. Um, one of the nice things I kind of like about it, some of those IPAs pack quite a punch. So if you're planning to sit around the pool or whatever around the campfire and have two or three of them, that can get. Get a lot of hand. This one's only five and a half percent alcohol, so you could you yeah, can have a couple of them and still keep it together a little bit. So what we call a crusher. Is that what that is? <laughs> yeah. Is that the session drink also, right? The session. Uh, not yeah. quite a session. Okay. I think you gotta get below five percent for that. Uh, all right. So yeah. we're pretty all close right. though. Yeah. All right. So that's beer number one. We'll hit a couple more here as we go. Uh, we're going to jump into some slides and we're going to focus on the. Uh,
they come up with here, but uh, we thought we had a fairly reliable internet source. Um, may or may not be the case. <clears throat> Hopefully you can at least see our uh, see our slides there. S start over from the first faster to switch over. Back to the slides, yeah, okay. Yeah. All right. So th this is our first slide still, so if we're back live, Jeremy says we're back up, so hopefully you guys are seeing this okay. But I uh, just wanted to talk a little bit about who c &E is uh, before we jump into the SMART series. <clears throat> this gives you kind of an overview of us. Uh, the the uh, graphic in the upper right there shows the geography that we cover, kind of that three and a half state area. And we cover that area with about 37 or so uh, outside sales folks we refer to as technology consultants. And then that second bullet there is one of the things that sets us apart from a lot of the other electrical distributors. We've got 19 engineers on staff, and, and really our uh, role is to help you develop bills and materials, help you spec out the right components. Um, and then, you know, from a post-sale standpoint, we also sit along beside you and make sure those products are successful and being deployed. Uh, we don't want to take ownership of the project. We want to kind of teach you to fish and uh, work alongside you guys to, to get things up and running. That's certainly the case for robotics. Um, you, know, you can also see in that picture down the bottom left is our new building that's uh, currently under construction. That picture is probably a couple weeks old. Jeremy was just actually over at the site about two hours ago and they're setting some uh, beams for the roof and, and some uh, rafters. So things are starting to come together over there. Uh, this is kind of what we were born on. So in 1978 we were founded. And this is, this is almost a uh, chronological order of, of uh, kind of the products that made us up. So we were found on Turk and Banner. That's kind of been our foundation forever. A uh, big part of who we are. And this first, the top three lines was sensors and vision and safety. Uh, hit those guys right in the sweet spot. The middle three lines are really based primarily on Siemens. So in 2000, we came online with Siemens as a, a full line automation and motion house. Uh, and of course the controls products along with that. And then the bottom three are really what we're focused on here with our, in our drinking from a distance series. So these are the three newer technologies, the C&E. Um, robotics is what we're talking today. And then we're gonna have a couple of these sessions focused on our pneumatics products. And then we're also gonna have one on our marketing systems uh, in our next series here. <clears throat> so we were founded in 78. That means that uh, 2018 was our 40th anniversary. And when we hit 40, like everybody else, we had a little bit of a midlife crisis, kind of rebranded. And uh, for those of you that have known us for a while, know that we were CNE sales forever up until 2018. We are now CNE advanced technologies. We thought that kind of reflected a little better on what we do. Um, and one main reason that I put this slide up here are really the uh, two middle core values of our four that I think speak a lot to collaborative robots. And even when we get into the mobile robot, it speaks even more to that. But, um, it's important for me to know that, that uh, our intent is always to do the right thing and that we've got your back. So we don't have any interest in selling you a rower and not operate. Uh, we are going to make sure that, that the robot is the right thing for your there with a, as you own it and, and put it to use. So that's a little bit about us. Let's talk a little bit about who Moto Man is. So the, the name has changed a little bit. They've always been part of Yaskawa. Um, it's been on and off a little bit over the years. I guess 31 years old now this year. So they were founded in 1989. Yaskawa is a much older company there you can see. But these guys are one of the big boys in industrial robots. So uh, depending on how you kind of rank things or how you count stuff, they're in the top two or three in the world for sure. Um, and you can get an idea there from the, the production they've got. So they're putting out 3,000 of these robots a month. They've got 150 different models. Um, so they are not a uh, fly-by-night new cobot kind of company, right? These are, this is a pretty serious operation. Um, the picture you see in the bottom right there is their North American headquarters that is located currently only about four miles. You saw the picture of our new building there. Once we move, we're actually going to get a little closer miles from from that location uh, you know there's probably I don't know 300 or so foot uh, uh, I'll tell you their training sessions are uh, they've got uh, nine different instructors I they've got 60 robots in the dedicated the classes are limited to 12 people no more than two person for a robot setup uh, really well done, full curriculum there. Uh, they also build all their pre-engineered solutions there, so their whole app. Their customer service folks are there, their repair stuff is there. 
Um, it's really an impressive place to come visit once you get a chance to do that. And uh, we'll take a little closer look at that. We may even have a video that kind of takes you inside of there at some point. Um, and Motorman did just recently. Release. If you followed me on LinkedIn, I just shared a couple days ago a video that kind of does a worth checking out. If you have some extra time on your hands. <clears throat> That's the right message, you know, we need to work to do chop off that bottom job and all the folks just take a step up. Uh oh, we lost like this keeps cutting and oh boy. Sounds like we're down on audio due to our internet connection. Um We'll see if we get that Keep going. If we get that back going. Yeah, we'll try to we'll try to hang with this here. Hopefully, the audio, the internet picks back up. Um, so, just some examples. You know, the Byron is showing. That, you know, we don't need the lamp lighter anymore with the advent of electricity. We don't need the operators doing this. And the TV picture tube here is actually a. I'm a personal example of this. I worked in a facility straight out of college after I left OU uh, as an engineer making TV picture tubes down in Circleville, Ohio. And, uh, you know, I hadn't been there probably a year. The boss calls me in the office and he shows me a flyer from Best Buy with a bunch of flat screen TVs in it. And he just kind of said, this, uh, this doesn't look good for us. So um, I decided, you know, well, I better find something else. And that's how I found CD and I've been a lot better for it. I certainly view that as a step up from where I was. And I think, you know, probably the people that were doing these other jobs found something a little more uh, purposeful to do. So this is an overview of the smart series that we're kind of focused on today. So it's really these uh, seven or eight robots I'm going to say right now, and I'll tell you why in a minute that we're focused on. And uh, kind of the you know the unique thing for Motoman is that we have collaborative and industrial robots and collaborative industrial robots. Um, these are heavy duty robots that have you know collaborative potential, uh, and it's the same software to program all of these things. So that is kind of a unique thing in the marketplace right now and uh, I think pretty valuable deal. The reason I said there's really only uh, seven robots currently part of the Smart Series, the HC20 that you see there is not currently set up with the Smart Pendant, but it will be. And the way we've got these model, um, the, the nomenclature for the models, the number you see in the, in the uh, model number, so the GP8, for example, the eight is an eight kilogram payload robot. So that number tells you the payload in kilograms. GP is general purpose. The HC is a human collaborative, so those are the white robots, and they have kind of the uh, power and force limiting capabilities that we're going to talk more about here in just a second. So then, if that if we have all those choices for robots, we talked about 150 different models. We got say probably to be expanded to more. How do I pick one? Uh, this this graphic kind of helps show that and and kind of determines which one you need. And what's also shown graphic are the four modes of collaborative operations. One of the things I really want to drive home today is that, um, you know, when we talk about a uh, modes of collaborative operation that are recognized by the RIA, and those are shown here in this chart. You see uh, stop state monitoring and you see speed and separation monitoring. And those are available in the GP robots, general purpose stuff. You don't have to have a uh, collaborative or PFL. We have those two modes of collaborative operation in, in, in just about every robot that we have. Uh, the two that are um, towards the bottom of the graph there are really are how fast you have the robot to go and then how fast does a person have to be. So that vertical axis talks about robot cycle time. So if the robot has to go faster, you're probably up top in the GP series. If it can go slower, then the HC may work for you. The other axis is how close does the person need to be to the robot. So if the, if the person needs to be right there, uh, you may need to have an HC, right? If it's there at every cycle, sharing space with that robot, you might need to need something that is PFL enabled. If not, maybe the GP would, would serve the purpose. They also, Motoman has a tool on their website called the Matchmaker 6000. You can go there and it'll ask you five or six pretty simple questions and that'll kind of help guide you toward a robot model, whether or not you need 
something PFL enabled or not, and then kind of uh, questions about the payload and the reach and the speed. There again, these are the two big questions, right? How fast do I have to go and how much does a person need to share space with the robot? That really drives me towards, do I need an HC or could I do it with a GP? And the reason you care about that is price, right? And cost. If you don't need PFL enabled, you might save yourself 20,000 bucks on a robot. So it, it's a, an important thing to, to think through. This graphic is just kind of a different uh, illustration of, of that. You know, how, how am I quantifying how much that operator needs? Our four modes kind of in a, a little different look. Um, so level one is safety rated monitors. The robot manufacturers have been going for a really long time. They're and waiting for that light clear before the robot takes back off. Nothing too fancy there, but too new for anybody. Level two in this picture is hand guiding. So the HC series for Motoman are the ones that allow us to hand guide it. That means that an operator goes over to the robot, initiates some kind of action, and manually moves it around and teaches points. Level three is the one that we probably need to spend a little bit more time as an industry kind of evaluating. So it's speed and separation monitoring, and maybe you've seen some examples of this. It almost always involves a laser scanner with multiple zones. So as the area is free, there's nothing in the laser scanner's path, the robot is working at full speed. And as somebody starts getting closer and closer, breaking multiple zones, the robot drops its speed slower and slower until it might finally stop, depending on what the risk assessment says. Um, so that is that speed and separation monitoring. And then the fourth mode is the one, like I said, is power and force limiting or PFL enabled. Is uh, PFL enabled. Um, and that one is the one that the HC series brings to us. This again, just to kind of to uh, ram this point home, the four modes of operation, this is a slide that Moto Man provided just to kind of show what they've done. So here, most Yaskawa robots have been able to stop monitoring and monitoring. And they do that through their FSU that we'll talk about in a minute, their functional safety unit. And then with the invention or with the introduction of the HC-10 in 2017, we now have the ability to do power and force limiting and hand guiding. Oops, sorry. So here's a little close to that term I just threw out, the FSU, the functional safety unit. Um, these are the six functions that are enabled when you have that. This shows up as an option board in your controller. Um, and these, these six things here are uh, kind of key to this collaborative operation. So if we look kind of vertically in columns, we look at safety range, range limitation and individual access range limitation. So this is all space restrictions about an independent joint or the actual tool center point. The middle speed related stuff. So do I have, I can control how fast the tool center point moves or I can control how fast the single joint moves. And then the, the last two tool angle monitoring. With tool angle monitoring, the common examples there are uh, if I have a laser on the end of the uh, robot arm or maybe a water jet, where I want to make sure that that tool is always focused on its workpiece. I don't want that thing shooting out into space. And then tool change monitoring is just checking, do I have the uh, end effector on the robot that you told me was going to be there? Uh, we're not going to go terribly deep in risk assessment. If you do have a drink of choice nearby right now, it'd be a great time to take a drink to get through some safety stuff. So um, I'm not, we're not going to go real deep right here. Um, Okay. Um, so as we get into the risk assessment, what you're driving towards is a level of risk for each individual scenario. Um, so, and then once you determine that for each thing, and, and those are based on, you know, how, how severe is my injury, how frequent am I exposed to the hazard, and then how likely am I to avoid the hazard. And that third one is a big deal for uh, when we look at uh, PFL and HUD, uh, by standard, PFL enabled robot maximum. And the reason is that's what we've determined uh, is that the, the difference between well, it's got a pretty good chance of hitting you. If it's going 250, we say you got a pretty good chance of getting out of its way. Um, so here, one of the uh, what level of risk we have in our application? Category and not worry about it. 
centers are involved, the highest you're most likely going to get is PLD in Category 3, and that's where we tend to live with a lot of these kind of applications. Just a couple other things just to kind of uh, let you know that there's some resources out there to help you. Um, this table is a uh, chart that gives you an idea of how hard, what kind of force can be applied to a person in different parts of their body before the onset of pain begins. So this study, interestingly enough, kind of go back to my OU days again here, they paid a bunch of college kids to sit in a room and get poked with different things in different places and say, does that hurt or not, right? And that's how this, this table was developed. So. This is a decent tool though for when you're looking at moving objects around and how fast they're moving and figuring out the force. This also helps you figure out things if you're using a uh, blunt object or a sharp object. If, uh, because it's based on pressures there, you can figure out how fast you can move and generate that force on smaller surface areas. And this again is just kind of a table that's available out there for reference. Uh, this is looking at robot effective mass versus obviously as you get heavier stuff you're moving around you have to go slower kind of but there's some reference information there all right so now we're going to switch over and take a look at our pendant our smart pendant um let me look at just a second here so we're going to flip i think to jeremy's phone now and get a close-up look at some of that stuff and then after we do that we're going to take a look at our second beer from jackie o's hopefully our audio and everything is still hanging in okay yeah we're, we sounds, got some uptime sounds like it's a little <laughs> bit a little bit of chop so uh, for an overview of what we have on the hardware here, we've talked some about the HC-10 already. Uh, so this is our first collaborative robot. And you can just kind of see by looking at it, it's got all rounded, smooth edges. There's not any sharp points on it. Even the tools, the end effectors we have here are made by OnRobot. Those are all kind of curved edges, no real sharp points there. The geometry of the robot is such that you don't have any pinch points in there. You can't grab somebody's hands. Um, so it's just kind of designed from the ground up to be a collaborative robot. It's not uh, take an existing robot and change the software and call it collaborative or PFL enabled. This green light on top tells us that PFL is enabled. You can turn that off if you want the robot to go faster. Uh, this is actually a reset button we'll take a look at a little later on here. Uh, this is actually the star of the show we're going to take a little closer look at in just a second. So before we do that, let's skip over here and look at our Moto Mini. So the Moto Mini is a little guy that kind of is almost competitive with um, the Scara level of robots at the, at the price level with a whole lot more flexibility. This guy has a half kilogram payload, can do like 1500 millimeters a second, some pretty precise moving. And it's controlled by our YRC1000 controller. So this is a six axis controller. It's basically the size of what an old desktop PC lo looks like. Uh, and it's also the same exact controller that's controlling our AC-10 in this cabinet over here. The difference in what's controlling the HC-10 currently in the Mini is that there's a PFL module or board that sits on top of the controller down here that's maybe another inch and a half or two inches higher that brings all the torque sensor information back into it. And then the smart pendant again, we're going to, uh, after we take a look at our second beer here, we're going to actually dial in and show you a zoomed in view of, of that thing. But it's really, again, the star of the show. It's the whole ease of use software that can be used to program the entire line of smart series, not just the HC. Um, but it's uh, it's really what's driving the, the smart series. So let's pause on that. Let's check out uh, the beer that Jeremy has found for us from Jackie O. So I told you earlier, Jeremy is a craft beer enthusiast. So he's not just going to go to the grocery store and buy the Who Cooks For You or the, the Mystic Mom or one of the red ones. He comes in with a, with a, uh, a special looking setup here. So you want to tell us a little bit about yeah, you? Yeah, I had to go to the bottle shop for this one, but uh, I've actually not had this one before and I've tasted it, but I assume it's a lot like uh, a lot of the other Jackie O's barrel aged beers. And uh, this one's called Middle of Nowhere, which is kind of apropos for where Jackie O's is located out now. Yeah, it's, that's right. That is definitely. Um, it's, uh, it was created as an homage to Appalachian agriculture. And that's important to Jackie O's because they actually have their own farm and they grow a lot of the ingredients that they use in their beers. I think they actually, you know, supply uh, local stores and whatnot with the stuff they grow out there. I've actually been out to the farm before for a hops growing seminar, and they actually grow some of their own hops out there. Too. Yeah. Um, but this is uh, an imperial oak stout brewed with honey and maple syrup and aged in bourbon barrels. This is from 2017. So and I'm guessing by this first taste that the alcohol content is a hair higher. Than yeah, I think it's somewhere around like 12%. <laughs> Let's uh, check this right. out. Yeah, yeah. We're at, uh, oh, 14%, 14, yeah, yeah, which yeah, actually yeah. used to be illegal in Ohio until like 2012 or something. Nice. Like yeah. So, yeah. yeah, so if you look yeah. at Jackie's website, 
They talk a lot about these uh, barrel-aged beers. They also talk about a lot about sustainability, their farm. They have a restaurant attached to the brewery up there, their, their public house they call it. Uh, they actually caught fire in uh, 2013 or 14, I believe. That's a, that's a big part of what they do, that whole sustainability thing. And it fits with the whole Appalachian theme. I mean, those folks try to live that way in that, in that part of the state. So Jack Eos fits in there pretty well. This thing is, uh, it's stout. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's you know pretty smooth for fourteen percent. That's true, it is. Yeah, yeah. haven't been in bourbon barrels. So. It's a it's a change from the uh, who cooks for you. I'm a fan. <laughs> yeah, I like it. No. It's good stuff. Okay, so let's uh, let's take a little closer look here at the smart plug screens for Whitney. Hopefully you will soon see the uh, the smart pendant online when she switches over to that. Hey, while we're talking about it too, and while we're switching over, I wanted to just kind of say I forgot to mention at the beginning there will be a quiz at the end. So I know instructors awfully they will oftentimes give you a uh, a joke, but we are going to do a ten question quiz at the end, and there's going to be some prizes um, as a result of that quiz. Disclaimer. Oh yes, and we also need to put in an official legal disclaimer is that. We don't endorse drinking uh, while at work, uh, so hopefully you guys are at home enjoying beverages with us. And uh, we're not here to promote anybody's products or have received any kind of uh, compensation for, for pushing Jackie O's or any of the other stuff that you're going to see during this Drinking From a Distance series. So I don't know if that'll make the lawyers happy, but we did it. <laughs> All right, so so now I think you can see our, uh, our smart pendant on the screen here, hopefully. And a couple of things that I just want to show you here. Um, one of the most unique things of the smart pendant is this smart frame jogging. So I'm in a brand new job here. You see it says new job two at the top. Uh, my servos aren't on yet, so I'll go ahead and click those guys on. You may be able to hear the, the robot whine a little bit. The servos are engaged. And this drop down here on the middle of the screen shows me the different modes that are available to jog the robot and start teaching positions. So I'm in smart frame mode right now. And if we're zoomed in far enough, you may be able to see next to the calibrate button, it's reporting back the angle of the pendant. So as I stand right here, it's kind of giving me a number somewhere around 40 degrees. And as, as I rotate the pendant, you can see that number kind of change. So it knows the orientation of the pendant relative to the base of the robot. Why that's important is that I can stand here, and if I want to move the robot to the right, I just tell it to go right, and it's right. Up and down, maybe a little less impressive, but it's still up and down. Say go away from me. Oh, and I got a little, got a little too fast there, so we'll slow him down. Just say go away from me come towards me, go left, and it still knows that's that direction. And as I move around, it updates with me, right? So now if I say go left, it knows this way is left. And this way is right, that way is away and toward. So that's a pretty unique deal. Um, so the, the map on the left is the robot frame. On the right, we have the tool frame and stuff. So you can see kind of middle of the screen on the right side, you see it says on robot dual RG2. So because we have two tools on here, I have to tell it which tool I'm working with. The RG2 here is our servo gripper, and this guy, the VG10, is the vacuum generator. So we're going to have another series focused just on our end effectors, and on robot will be a part of that. We'll tell you more about those things then. Uh, but what I wanted to show you here is the rotate button in the middle. So if I hold this guy down, the robot is going to mimic what I'm doing with the tablet, so with the smart pen. So I hold this button down and I rotate it that way, and it tries to maintain the tool center point here of my RG2 and rotating it the same way that I'm rotating the tablet. So it's just another little tool, another way for you to kind of manipulate the end effector as you get into position and do some stuff. And then if we look at our other options here, the one thing, again, that is uh, fairly unique here is the hand guiding feature. But you see you've got standard joint mode, you've got XYZ world tool and user. So folks that are used to programming a robot with something that looks a lot more like this, right? This is the standard pendant, which you can use on any of these robots also. They're interchangeable. Um, so those things are more normal. So here you see the six joints. You also see under where I was talking about RG2 there, kind of on the middle right side of the screen, you see the uh, an indication of this relative to its limits. They are, uh, or swing axis, the, the bottom kind of waist axis, is set down there fairly close, but make negative 78 degrees. If I start swinging it further and further negative, you see that little white marker there kind of start going towards the left. And if I go far enough, it'll go to the yellow state and tell me, hey, you're getting close to a limit. If I go too far, it'll, hit, it'll go red and say, hey, you hit the limit, so stop going that way. And on the right side of the pendant, you probably can't see it on the screen. You may be able to see it here on the camera. 
You also have membrane keens, so I have that same jogging ability over here with membrane if you prefer that over the, the touch screen. So that's joint mode, but I want to show you hand guiding. So right now I've got XYZ freedom and tool that I can do with hand guide mode. I go to the robot, I can set the pendant down, there's buttons here on this collar. So this is an HC10DT, which means it's a direct teach, so it's got this collar on it. I can hold down the one key and then I've got control of the robot to move it where I want. I also have teach buttons on both sides of this collar, so once I get it to a position I want it in, I hit software now, you see we've got a new position that showed up in there, and it falls into a joint move at 5% of speed. I'm going to change that to, oops, sorry, I'm going to change that from a joint move to a linear move, and 50 millimeters a second is probably a little slow for what we're doing. So remember, 250 a second with PFL enabled is the max we can do, so we're going to go about 150 millimeters. So I can go back to hand to hand mode if I want and say, all right, here's a second point. Let's learn that guy. And then we'll give it a third point, put it in hand mode and say, all right, there's a third point. So it's not moving very far, but we've got three different points and so we can kind of get it moving that way. I'm going to go back in here and just switch these over to, to uh, oops, not the circle, but the linear moves. And we'll make, uh, we'll make that one go 150. And we'll leave this one a little slower just so you can kind of see what, what 75 millimeters a second. So, oops, sorry. Switch to linear move first. We certainly don't want to go 750 just yet. So 75 millimeters a second. And then also in the middle of the screen, you see some of the other things you get the ability to do. So I've got digital outputs in here. Once I hit that third spot and I want to turn a digital output on, it's just that simple. And if I don't want to turn on output one, but I really want to turn on output three, I just hit that. And that, you know, if I want to turn it off instead of on or invert it, you can do that also pretty simply. You can also add timers in here. So pretty easy access for sorts of things. Uh, if you've got sub functions, which would be pretty typical, you just go to a call. And then on the right side over here, you see all the different jobs that are available to call as a subroutine over here. So if we wanted to call the crush can routine, for example, we could do that. We say save on those guys. If I want to go back and, and uh, comment any of the lines, because as you start developing programs, you're like, well, where was that first position at? I don't know what the heck that was. I go into my comments section over here, and I can just type in, this is actually position one. And it'll throw a comment at the end of that line, so you can see it pretty easily as you're walking through the program. Um, so we've got three positions in here. I think what I want to do is just maybe let it run through this and I want to show you one more feature um, as this thing is cycling. The servo is on. We're kind of at the top of our program. Uh, I want to show you one other thing before I do that. So position one, let's say I wanted to go back to position one at the end of our routine. I hit our little edit tool here and now I've got cut and copy and paste functionality. So I want to copy that position. And I want to put it down here right after we turn this digital output on and wait a second. And we're going to hit paste right there and throw that line in there. Uh, I don't want to crush. I want to go ahead and take that guy back out. Oops, not our settings tool, but under edit. We go up and hit delete. So now we've got four positions. Basically, we're going to turn an output on. And wait. Now it goes ahead and turns the servos off while we're doing that. Uh, so we're in auto mode. I'm going to turn my servos again do that through the touch screen or I can push the membrane key. So now our servos are back enabled and I can either now, if I can go to test run, I can do one cycle or I can do a continuous operation. So I'm just going to let this guy run continuously. And if I hold this down, it's going to start now running through those three points that we just caught. So you see it hitting those points. It's going to hit that digital output and wait for a second in this one position. And then it's going to go back to the home position. It's just going to keep doing that loop. And what I want to show you here is because we have the HC10 with PFL capabilities, we've set some force limits in there that for the robot to look at, hey, if I exceed this limit, then I need to stop, right? So it's got that in there. It exceeds that force limit. It pops up and says, hey, we've got a PFL here. Somebody can come up. We've now got this reset. Right back off running from, from where it was. So that's a pretty handy little feature there. All right, so we'll go ahead and stop that. I'm going to show you just a couple other things here while we're in the uh, while we're in the tablet. Uh, under Program Operate, this is where you can go I.O. One thing I forgot to mention earlier when we were looking at the hardware, the robot comes with eight in and eight out and two airlines plumbed through the center hollow arm that just come out the middle wrist here. Because we have this on robot dual gripper set up on there, so we're not using those right now in this configuration, but uh, that's kind of how the robot ships with those I.O. 
Um, the safety settings, so we've talked about the edge. Uh, this is where you find those guys. We go into safety functions. And if I go into new setting, it's going to say, you can't do that in auto mode. So over to manual mode. We go into a new setting, and now you see those things that we talked about earlier. So here are my space limitations and my speed limitations that I can set up, and also my external force monitors. So I told you those, those torque sensors um, are looking at specific values that are programmed in there, and this is exactly where you do it. Uh, so down here you see the default settings. So we've got force monitor 5 that says always on, kind of towards the bottom half of the screen. And you can set it up as a uh, result three axes there, X, Y, and Z, and you can click on any one of those and modify it between the uh, limits. So that those value tables are about what kind of impacts you're able to, to hit somebody with based on what you're carrying and how fast you're going. And it's nothing we've got set up here in this robot already. Um, let's see. Safety. Uh, let's see, utility stuff there. Uh, you can calibrate the torque sensors through this thing, and, and that's kind of a, a general overview, I think, of the software. It gives you an idea of how easy it is just to at least get up and running. There's certainly a lot more advanced stuff. Uh, there's new versions of this software pendant coming out, not every month, certainly, but maybe every quarter or so. So there's going to be a new release that they're actually going to bring in their 2D vision package soon. Um, so that'll be a nice update, and I think there's also going to be some new robot models added. So that is the smart pendant, and again, that works with everything in the smart series so general purpose robots also with that guy all right so um, I think now we are about ready for our a couple more slides actually Whitney if we could switch back to the uh, switch back to our presentation we'll show you two more slides and then we'll do our quiz This guy in slideshow mode for you. All right. So um, you see nine applications here. These are all kind of highlighted on Motoman's website that's dedicated to the Smart Series. So if you go to smart.motoman.com, you'll see these nine things here. And these are pretty common applications that we're tackling with the Smart Series. Machine tending is a really big one. Uh, you also see on here things like screw driving and palletizing and case packing. A lot of really common robotic applications, right, that these, these robots can handle. With the Smart Series, we're up to a 25 kilogram payload and about a 1400 millimeter reach. So you can cover a whole lot of ground with that, that set of robots that we've got there. Um, all of these have videos, so you can see them all working in operation. They're all just a couple minutes long, so you don't have to spend a whole lot of time. And Jeremy and I, I think are hoping once we're, once we're allowed to, we're going to get into that showroom over in Motoman. Uh, they have all the demos set up that they take to trade shows there, uh, and they have um, really nice application examples of all the, the GP series, smart series running, and I think we're going to do a, a more in-depth video kind of going into some of those applications. One of the things that comes up a lot is wanting to move the robot around, especially for machine tending. You might want to move it between tools, so this is what we're showing here. The, the picture on the left is currently at Motoman showroom. It's showing an HC10 using the laser scanners to do that speed and separation monitoring. You see the laser scanners kind of at the bottom of the, the picture there, uh, but the robot will uh, operate at full speed when the laser scanners are clear. It'll load that tool up and kind of take it back out of the machine and put it on the rack. Uh, and if somebody breaks the laser scanners, it drops down into that PFL speed of 250 millimeters a second. It also goes slow speed when it's closing the door to make sure it's not pinching anybody's arm in the uh, door of the machine tool. The middle picture is a uh, fully enclosed cart, so you've got the controller, the YRC-1000, under that white hood, so you could roll that thing over to a machine and plug it in. And then the third picture is the concept that's not yet ready for sale, but it's a battery-powered cart, so you wouldn't necessarily have to plug it in somewhere. They're developing that in conjunction with IM Robotics. So part of our job, or my job, as a robotics business developer is to bring this stuff out to you. So once again, once we're allowed to do that, we have this Ford Transit you see here with the lift on the back. We'll pop these things on the truck and bring it to your facility and show it to you. Uh, a better tour, actually, is Moto Man showroom. So if you're fairly close to Dayton and are up for that field trip, again, when we're able to, we'd love to have you come, come take a look at that stuff in there, but we can also bring it to you. The last thing we're going to say here on our presentation is free online training. This is probably one of the best 
online courses I've done for any of our uh, manufacturers. Um, if you do the, the entire content, all the courses that are there, it's probably several hours worth of work. And it's really the only course that Motoman has right now dedicated to the smart pendant. It's, you know, it's fairly intuitive, so there's no reason to do a four and a half day class on the smart pendant, I don't think. This thing will get you hitting the ground running pretty well. Um, uh, there are other classes, even with the HC10, are currently taught with the standard pendant. Uh, I have heard that because of the, the current situation, you can't do training, so some of the trainers are reworking their curriculum, so maybe they will work the smart pendant into that. But this free online tool, <clears throat> if you're interested in taking a deeper dive, this is certainly the next place to go. That's kind of an overlook at our line card. And I think with that, we are pretty well set to do our quiz. So Whitney has a game code. I think you can go join myquiz.com. She's going to show you that, that game code on the screen. Robot run a little bit. And uh, while we do that, we're also going to talk about our third beer once I get that set up. So the website, if you didn't get that, hopefully is going to be on your screen. But if you go to join my quiz, there's going to be 10 questions there. There's going to be 10 seconds per quiz. There will be winners at the end. The top three folks are going to get some gifts today. Those gifts are going to be a model HC10 robot, a CNE pint glass, and then the top three. And then we're going to do a uh, gift from either your brewery of choice or something from Jackie Yo's. If, you, if you're up for that, we'd certainly like to send you something from Jackie Yo's. Um, but if you have your own personal preference of a brewery, we'll talk with you after we get to the winners. And if you would like something from there, we'll get you something from that location. Uh, it'll be a $25 limit for third place, a $50 limit for second place, and a $75 limit for first place, in addition to the uh, model robot and the pint glasses. So hopefully Whitney's getting that queued up. Uh, I'm going to set this guy up over here. If we're starting to get some folks popping into the thing, we'll let them get another minute or two probably to get game room. And then once uh, we're happy that we have enough of the folks on board, um, she's going to hit start. And then those questions are going to start coming to you. And, and then hopefully you'll be able to see the leaderboard. The questions come pretty quick and only 10 seconds of pop. So you may not have much chance to check the leaderboard in, but we'll, uh, we'll definitely put that up there. You'll want to hopefully put your, your real name in there. Um, so it's easier for us to contact contact the winners. Um, if you do go with something else, we'll, we'll figure out. Anything. I'll check them when we're ready. She's going to hit start. Just kind of a fun little demo here set up with our uh, Jack EO's can. And uh, we're going to go ahead and put that guy in auto mode and turn our servos on. And you can at least watch that until we cue that, uh, cue that one up. Hey, Dana, repeat one more time how to join the quiz. Yet. Last about, yeah, last call to get into the quiz. If you go to joinmyquiz.com, there's a game code that's on the screen over there. Both the address and the game code should be there. So you should be able to get to joinmyquiz.com. Put in, I believe it's a six-digit code, um, and, and join the fun. Cheers. We get Jeremy back in here while you guys are doing that. We can talk about our third beer from Jackie O's. I think we've got about 10 seconds left before Whitney hits start on the quiz. So if you're not in yet, hopefully you're getting pretty close. So I'm going to go ahead and pour our third beer. So this beer is kind of the flagship beer from Mystic Mama, from Jackie O's. It's called Mystic Mama. It's more a traditional 
uh, pay them off for maybe there. Um, is it, the More quiz start? One? Yeah. Quiz is on? Well, uh, it's starting soon. Oh, okay. All right. She's probably firing it up. Well, let's go ahead and pour this thing. I think she said she started it. Okay. Say, so started? Woo! Good thing I wasn't a bartender today. <laughs> yeah. I'll take that one. I think the robot might do it. <laughs> Should have let it. There we go. So I was just saying, this is kind of the flagship beer from Jeff. Um, we talked about their fall. The interesting thing about these guys is they were actually the second craft beer in o Ohio to be in cans. So uh, Mad Tree in Cincinnati. It's all right. Uh, Mad Tree in Cincinnati was the first one. Jack was the second, actually. Um, so their beer today is distributed... Uh, primarily in Ohio. I think they said about 97% of their beers in Ohio. There's a few uh, counties kind of across then, and then uh, also somewhat in California today. But uh, I think it's made pretty well all over Ohio now. So. Yeah, I, I think you can't go anywhere in Ohio without finding it. Yeah, right. Not a lot. You know, looking around Dayton uh, here, even this week, there's a few places, and it's typically they might have six or eight six packs on the shelf. So it's not a lot of stuff, but a lot of places have at least some of them. Let's try the Mystic Mama here. I think this is almost manageable. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you. What do you think? It helps to have fresh can for sure. Yeah. No, it's it's been one of my that favorites. That detectable? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, this one's been around yeah. for quite a while. Yeah. This is actually a little bit spring so and I've kind of found myself that uh, when those, that weather comes around, I start reaching for the IPAs more than the winter time for whatever reason. Yeah. The last couple of weeks, he goes around to various. And he goes, yeah, That's true. Some, yeah. Uh, it's pretty good watching if you're into kind of those travel shows or they. Have... Yeah, but I can't hear you. No audio. Okay. Where's your phone? Is it I'll be ready. We may be having audio issues still. So I might just be here drinking beer and nobody's hearing me. That's okay. All right, looks like we're getting close to the end here. Hey, one other disclaimer. There are some C&E folks on the line, and you guys are not eligible for prizes, you bunch of cheaters.
All right, so you guys should be seeing now the results are there. I think there might be some CNE folks that are at the top of that board. So we will reach out to the top three people that are not CNE employees and uh, arrange your uh, prizes and deliveries for your shipment, maybe. Uh, hey, we appreciate you guys joining us today. This is kind of a new thing for us. Uh, we'll work through some of these technical difficulties, hopefully for the next five weeks. Uh, next week is going to be some pneumatic stuff. And then we're going to do the mobile robots in two weeks. Back to pneumatics again, robotic indefectors, and then uh, labor labeling systems. Actually, I might have switched labeling systems and pneumatics in there. Jeremy, I appreciate you hanging out and drinking some beers with me today. Yep, Hopefully going. you guys at home hey, uh, your, got, the, uh, got the sink some also. The, the programming, yeah. It went, it did, yeah, yeah. We did. Oh, yeah, 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 thank you. Though. All right, we're going to sign off, guys. Thank you. Appreciate it. Reach out to us if we can help out. Take care.